Hey, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. I want to start out with an email that I received yesterday from Paul O'Neill. Paul writes, thanks for your daily Life on the Civil War Research Trail videos that you post on YouTube. I really enjoy them and have learned a lot about Civil War photos, so much that I have just recently started collecting old CDV and cabinet card photos. Paul, I can't thank you enough for the email, and I want to welcome you as best as I can to the Civil War collecting community. And thinking about the best way to do that is really to give you and others who are watching a brief history of the modern Civil War collecting movement, which has its origins in the 1950s. So I want to take you back to that time period. The last living veterans of the Civil War had passed or were passing, each receiving media coverage in newspapers across the country, much like World War II veterans were receiving and still receive as they leave the scene. Meanwhile, during that time in the 50s, families were beginning to lose connection to their Civil War ancestors. The great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren were forgetting who was the soldier in this old photo that was in a photo album. Around that same time in the 50s, historian and journalist Bruce Catton wrote an incredible series of books, The Army of the Potomac Trilogy. His writings were produced in the wake of World War II and the rising tide of the civil rights movement. There was a great quote that I want to share with you by David Blight, who was an acclaimed professor of history at Yale University. He notes that Catton's works became a national siren call into the past to the scenes of a distant but deeply resonant war. So Catton captured the attention of the American public who was beginning to lose track of the Civil War. And then in 1957, the U.S. Congress passes an act creating the United States Civil War Centennial Commission. These events were all raising the Civil War into the public awareness, the public conscience, bringing it out. And as you might imagine, these events in newspapers and on early television were motivating kids who were collecting baseball cards, playing marbles, to start finding these old relics, uniforms, uh, paper material, photographs. One of those kids is a man named Ross Kelbaugh. He's the author of a book called Introduction to Civil War Photography. He coined a phrase that I think is a great one. He referred to these pioneer collectors, these 1950s kids, as the centennial generation. Another one of those kids, Rich Jan of Paramus, New Jersey, told me in an interview in 2016, quote, there was a kid in my neighborhood and he had a big tray of Civil War photos. That must have been the late 1950s, maybe 1960. So in that decade of the 1950s, we see the beginnings, the origins of the modern collecting movement. It might have died out, but it didn't. It really caught on. In the 1960s and 70s, you see a period of growth. And I want to take it in 1963, Francis A. Lord publishes a book called The Civil War Collector's Encyclopedia. This is really the first book that really begins to recognize the community, put values on various items, including weapons, uniforms. There's even a photograph section. It's a small chapter, but it recognizes the fact that these relics, these old photos that these kids began collecting in the 1950s had value and had meaning to Americans. During the 60s and 70s, this community begins to take shape. You begin to see mail order catalogs, physical civil war shows become a thing. And this community of collectors grows up, comes of age, if you will, around these events. In 1975, this is an important year because William Frazanito, his landmark volume, 
Gettysburg, A Journey in Time is published. And an explosion of interest in battlefield photography takes place. You know Bill's work, these detailed maps that he did locating where the photographers were, showing modern images of the Gettysburg battlefield compared to the historic images of Gardner and Brady and others. One of those individuals who was inspired by Frasnito's work is a man named Harry Roach. Harry had his own ideas and he thought, well, if Frazzanito could do this for battlefield photography, maybe I could do the same thing for portrait photography of the Civil War period. In 1979, he founded a magazine called Military Images, the mission of that magazine to showcase, interpret, and preserve historic photography. That's the magazine that I edit today. It's still around. In the 1980s and the 1990s, the Civil War collecting community continues, continues to flourish and really grows into its own. There's a vibrant marketplace of dealers and collectors that are networking. There's a steady flow of information thanks to military images and other publications and a rise of authoritative voices that are representing relevant aspects of the hobby. There are other two other movies, or I should say, two uh, movie events and a series of events. Glory in 1989 and in 1990, Ken Burns' series. Those two movie, film, TV events ignite new waves of collectors and the hobby even swells larger and larger. It's also important to mention at about this time, the idea of photo collectors as caretakers begins to take shape. We don't think of ourselves as owners of these images. We're the caretakers of them. We're part of that chain, that generational chain that is holding these images to be passed on to the next generation. In the 1990s, the advent of the commercial internet disrupts the photo community much like other communities around the world. Forums, blogs inject new ideas and scholarships. New voices come into play, as well as many, many, many unpublished photographs that folks can produce and publish easily enough. You also see social media. The rise of social media begins in the 2000s, and you see a whole new community. Facebook begins to have its various groups. Civil War Faces by Doug York, Civil War Faces Marketplace, The Image Collector by Dale Neeson, many other communities begin to show up. Technology goes beyond the internet. You begin to see a whole new community that occurs around Civil War Photo Sleuth, which is founded by Kurt Luther. The mission there is to identify images using face recognition technology and good old fashioned photo sleuthing. So you've got the community getting larger and larger. Technology doesn't hamper it, technology only enhances it. So here we are today, it's 2023. We've now been through 70 years of collecting and it continues to grow, it continues to change. Thanks to individuals like Paul O'Neill, the guy who emailed me yesterday about joining the community, we've got new generations of Americans who are really discovering photography, discovering these Civil War portraits. And it's easy to focus on the physical characteristics of them. It's easy to talk about the timeline. But when you get down to it, when you look into the faces of these Civil War soldiers, whether they're carts de visite or tintypes or ambrotypes of them in uniform during the war or post-war cabinet cards and other photographs of them as veterans. These images speak to us. They call to us, much like Bruce Catton's work did in the 1950s. These images reach out to us today. They talk to us over time. And you know what? These old soldiers, they have stories connected to them. And those stories tell us about who we are. They tell us about our history during one of the most turbulent, tumultuous, and terrible times in our nation's history.
So to Paul, a hearty welcome, a tip of the cap and a salute to the Civil War community for all that you do to keep history relevant, to keep these images relevant. With that, I'll leave it here and we'll see you on the next episode. Take care.